All right, and we are recording, and I will just, by way of introduction, uh, unmute my... Oh, no, you can see me. Um, uh, so my name is Chris Betcher. I uh, am hosting this series of five webinars on the Understanding Google Workspace for Education Plus. Uh, I'm a member of the Google for Education team here in Sydney, and I'm joined with by my colleague, Richard Johnson. Um, and Rich is the much more technical one of the two of us, and uh, we'll be answering all your hard questions. Um, Rich, can you just go to the next slide for me, please? Uh, and that's what we'll be talking about, security with Google for Education. And uh, just before we do, I, yeah, next slide, thank you. Um, just as we always do, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet, recognise the continuing connection to land, water and community, and pay our respects to them and their cultures, elders, past, present and emerging. And you can see those lovely artworks there that we commissioned um, from uh, the uh, Nangala Creative uh, Group to uh, represent some of the different Indigenous nations around Australia. Okay, uh, next slide. And um, this is part of a series of five webinars that we've been running uh, and will be continuing to run over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and they are particularly aimed at looking at the features in the plus editions of Google Workspace. Uh, as most of you would be aware, we've now got four editions of Google Workspace, ranging from the free one that everyone has had for many years through to uh, a couple of editions with various features. But mainly we're talking about the plus edition today, which is basically the all the bells and whistles, the, the edition in which you get everything, all the security features, all the teaching and learning features and everything. Um, and it's particularly, we're putting these webinars on for members of our Catholic uh, education friends across the eastern seaboard of um, Australia, uh, so from right up on the tip of Queensland all the way up, all the way down to Tasmania. Uh, that includes all the, the uh, dioceses as part of CENET and of course the Melbourne Archdiocese of Catholic Schools. Uh, both of those groups have recently moved on to PLUS, or at least many of the dioceses in those groups have. Um, and so we're putting on this webinar series to try and make sure everyone is aware of the features that you now have that you didn't have before and just to help you make sure you're getting the most value from them. And with that preamble, I'm going to hand over to my good colleague Richard Johnson um, to introduce himself and get started. Thanks, Chris. Hello, everyone. Good to see some familiar faces again. Um, this session today is going to go through some of the security features. I'm going to um, talk about our global security very, very quickly. I'll breeze through that um, just so you get a sense of what our infrastructure is like. I'll talk about the security features of Workspace Plus. I've got some time for some scenarios and demos at the end, and then I'll hopefully have enough time for Q&A. Um, if you have any questions throughout, uh, if they're quick ones, by all means, you can pop it in the chat um, or um, unmute yourself and ask. Um, don't forget, we are recording this as well. Yeah, I will be monitoring the chat. So if anything comes up, um, just pop it in the chat. I will uh, keep an eye on it and let Rich know. Right. Very quickly, this is our um, Google for Education team that represents Australia and New Zealand. So you should be familiar with these five people here. Um, they're the people that look after your organizations from a Google perspective. Okay, global security. So uh, when I talk about Google Workspace for Education, um, it is a massive product. Um, it is a global platform that goes across the globe. Uh, when, it's, uh, when you look at it from a network point of view or a point of present point of view, this is what the map looks like. So this is our infrastructure across the world. And as you can see, the, there in Australia, there is a point of presence, which means all of your data goes through a point of presence to go to our next data center. And these are private lines that go across the world. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. Oh, there's a few people coming in. You can't see that on the screen. Uh, OK. As we start to send information back and forth over these private lines, um, Google does something very special that no one else really does across the world. We secure your data by encrypting that data and chunking that data. So we break it up into little pieces and we wrap it um, with encryption. It goes down the private lines all the way to our data center. When you open up a file again, it comes back, puts it all back together again. And this, this is for redundancy and security measures as well. So if the data center goes down, we can recover your data quite easily. Um, and make it available to you. Um, so we have a great uptime, um, but also from a um, security perspective, if someone broke into one of our data centers through the mission impossible layers of security um, and they got a hard drive and pulled it out, it would be absolute nonsense to them and that wouldn't be readable. 
Uh, there, and then the last piece of this is just to give you an idea of how we build our infrastructure um, and secure your data is we build everything from top down. So we build the data centers all the way down to the chips. So the network, which I just showed you, the storage, even the racks inside the data center are built by us. The hard drives are built by us. We destroy the drives when they become useless as well. We turn them into confetti. Um, the server racks are all built by us. And then even the chips down to the Titan chips that go into uh, things like Chromebooks um, that the end users have. Okay, with that in mind, I'm now gonna jump into a lot of the features that are in Workspace Plus. So these features are where we take security above and beyond the standard features that you receive in uh, Workspace or the default features that you've got. And it brings in new concepts that you need to have a think about, as well as what things you want to put in play for your education facilities. So a lot of these will have to align with the policies that you have in place. The first feature I'm going to talk about is what we call context-aware access. Um, some of you might know it from um, the Microsoft world or another world as conditional access. Um, so conditional access is um, giving a meaning to when should a particular person be able to access the workspace services. And there are three ways that you can go about this using Workspace Plus. One, you can do it based on IP address. So you can say, if someone is not on my network, they cannot access workspace services. Number two, is a company owned device or a device um, posture uh, configuration? So for example, if they need to be on a Chromebook or it needs to be on a certain version of Chrome, then you can do that as well. So you can say you must have the latest updates or antivirus software um, posture to be able to access the workspace services for your security purpose. And the third one is geolocation. So you can say only people in Australia can access the workspace service in my tenant. So those three uh, go there a little bit, I guess, on the extreme side, but your policies may say to you, hey, we need to secure this in a much better fashion. Now, you could use these as a first gate opportunity to stop um, brute force attacks um, in terms of people trying to log into your students' accounts or um, your end user accounts, and they try and log in from overseas, they might stop be stopped at the first gate. So that's a prevention measure. So have a think about those ones. Um, they are available to you in the admin console um, under your security settings. Okay. Data loss prevention. So first of all, data loss prevention, it, there is a standard DLP function as part of Workspace. Uh, what we do as part of uh, the Workspace Plus is take it a little bit further and we combine it with things such as labels and Google Chat. There's a couple of other things, but I wanna talk about the labels component of this. So DLP to start with is when you scan across your system and you look for keywords or regular expressions. These can be things from credit cards, Medicare, or it could be cyberbullying words, right? Or inappropriate words. Um, they can be used to detect and create conditions for different documents, um, emails, or chat, those sort of attributes. When we introduce labels, labels is basically data definitions. Um, so if a document contains, um, you know, it's a top secret document, contains PII data, you can put a label on it. You as the admin can either put a label on it, the end user can put a label on it, or you can have DLP run across your system and put a label on it. And you can do that for two very good things. Um, one, DLP will stop that uh, particular file being shared out if it has personal information or it has cyberbullying effects on it. The other thing is the label puts a label on top of the document so everyone else is aware of it, and you can change the retention rules as part of that. So for example, if I have a top secret document containing personal information about students or an incident, I can put a label on it. I can then retain that document for 10 years rather than the standard seven years that I've set up in bulk. So a really, really good feature, good for auditing, it may not apply to your students, but it might apply more to teachers um, in the field that are handling this sort of information. Now, some of these features I'll try and show you as a demo in the admin console, but I'm going to go through some scenarios while I do the demos. Okay, drive trust rules. So, um, 
as part of the fundamentals edition, you're probably used to uh, changing the sharing rules at a very top level. So saying that your organization cannot share with another organization or share files out into the public. What Drive Trust Rules it does is it takes it down to a more granular level. Now, inside each of your tenants, you probably have a number of schools. You may want to set a policy that each school does not share documents with the, the other schools inside your tenant. Or you could say a class inside your tenant cannot share with another one. This is all based on OUs and groups. So you can say one group shares with another group or they don't share with that other group as well. This is reasonably easy to set up. However, most of the time is spent on understanding what your policies are. So it does involve a couple of teams from your organization to come back and say, these are what the sharing permission should be. And then it's up to the IT admin to put this in place. As you can see from the screenshot on here, you can see it's reasonably simple to set up. You set up the rule, you then specify which organization or unit you want it to apply to, and the next screen will specify whether you want to put sharing in place or not. Okay, uh, Vol, I left this one in here just as a reminder that when you um, put labels on a document, you can extend the uh, retention of a file. Um, Vault is a standard feature as part of fundamentals. Um, a lot of questions I get is, does this actually contribute towards your storage? No, Vault does not contribute towards your storage. But from a label point of view, just keep that in the back of your mind for retention purposes. Okay, uh, Alert Center. So one of the new things that comes through with Plus is an Alert Center around uh, things such as um, phishing, uh, compromised accounts, um, all the sort of security threats. Um, now, we do have standard alerts in there. However, you may want to go above and beyond. Um, a lot of the thresholds for these alerts are set to low. So that means you would have to wait to get multiple alerts before an email gets sent through to an administrator's mailbox. You may want to go in there and change those alerts um, up to a high threshold, or sorry, not high threshold, but um, high alert status, so every single alert comes through or you want to keep it at low. Um, you can set custom alerts through the investigation tool. I'll show you that um, in a second. I'll run through that feature. So here we have the security center, and this is the main, I'm going to say it's the main crux of Workspace Plus from a security point of view. Uh, it contains three major components. One is um, security health, security dashboard, and the investigation tool. Uh, from a security health perspective, this is something that um, actually scans your systems to see if you've made a configuration change um, for any security config. If you have not made that change, say it's a new feature that's come in and you haven't even looked at it, it will flag it to you in the security health section. It will mark off whether you've changed it or not, so you can easily go through the list, click on each one, that needs to be changed. And it also gives you a recommended state as well with an explanation as to why you would want to use this setting. So very, very helpful feature. Best to have a look at this at least once a month to go through just for your own posture, just for your own understanding of what's changed, what hasn't changed. Um, and yeah, it's a great checklist to use. Uh, you can use this in conjunction with a what we have a, a, a security checklist online as well, which is a little bit deeper than this. Um, and you, if you have a partner that's involved to help you out, they can also do a health check in alignment with this as well. Okay, the investigation tool. This is a post-incident um, tool that you can use to identify um, attributes throughout your system, understand events that have unfolded, but also to f further this, you can actually action on them as well. So I'll give you an example. Um, if someone, if your organization is sharing files externally, um, you may see that as a threat. So what you do is you'd go in here, you'd go into drive logs, and you'd say, show me all the files that are being shared externally. You can see all the files listed. You can export that list. But what you can also do is click on individual files or the whole set of files and change the sharing permissions. So you can go in there and you can say, remove all sharing permissions. That brings all the files back in-house so no one else can see them outside of your outside of your organization 
or you can change the ownership of them. So you can say, because you've shared these outside, I'm changing the owner to this person, you need to contact them. So it's a very, very powerful tool. From the investigation tool, you can actually create dashboards, which I'll show you in the next section. You can create alerts. You can save the investigations as well um, so that you can go in there next time and you can rerun them. You can also rerun them from the dashboard itself. So here's the security dashboard. And again, I'll log into the console, I'll show you an example of this. But this is where you can, as the IT administrators, or if you need to show a CISO or your security team, um, these are where standard dashboards are created. So Google ourselves, we create some dashboards for you so you can go and have a look at the standard ones from like phishing, compromised accounts, all those sort of ones are in there. But you can create your own custom ones from your own investigations. So as I mentioned the example before, if you wanted to monitor and see the trends of external fi of files going shared externally out of your organization, you can actually see that on a graph and you can see and pinpoint where are the peaks and where are the troughs and the reasons why. Okay, security sandbox. Um, one thing that we've noticed with, at Google is that um, while you can put a lot of gates and a lot of security features in place, at the end of the day, the end user is still responsible for opening, not opening that email attachment. And as much as, as the training goes into end users telling them how they should identify this, there's still gonna be that one person in your organization that is unsure and potentially gonna open that attachment. Now, that attachment, if you're on a Chromebook, that's not too much of a worry. However, if you're on another system, you probably wanna secure it as best as possible. So what we've done is we've created what we call a security sandbox. So this means that when you open up an attachment inside Gmail, we actually place it in a sandbox environment first. So if there is malware or ransomware in there and it tries to execute, it only executes within that sandbox environment. And if it tries to, we close it down and we warn the user that this particular attachment is malicious and not to open it. So it's a good security checkpoint just to stop and prevent that from happening through um, email methods of transmission. Okay, access transparency. So um, when Google, when you raise a support case with Google, uh, sometimes our engineers will need to go into your console to help you um, determine what the issue is or to validate something. And usually they do that in conjunction with you. When they do this, um, you'll actually be able to see a log of where our engineers, our support engineers have been in your organization, in your console, but also you will be able to give permissions as well. So for example, you may see that a support person needs to go into your users, um, your user list. Now that contains PII data. Do they really need to go in there? You can actually control whether they're allowed to go in there or not to see that. So access transparency gives you that, um, that logging information of seeing where everyone's going um, as part of it. Okay, now I know some of you have actually started exploring this, but this is a BigQuery export. Now, while this is basically what you might call, you know, dumping data into another system, it's actually can, can be used for two powerful purposes. One is to, drive analytics across your organization. So see um, how many people are using a particular uh, document, how many people are using classroom, interactions, all that sort of stuff. On the other side of things, you can actually use these log files as part of the scene. So you can export them into a scene, or you can just retain the logs for information later on. And the reason I say that is the logs inside Google Workspace are only uh, relevant for six months. They only get stored for six months. Um, after that, they disappear. This is where the BigQuery export functionality allows you to push all of those logs out into the Google Cloud Platform and store them for a longer period of time, push them out to a scene, or use them for analytical purposes. Um, and we have a whole team that looks at the analytics and um, use of this data as well for educational purposes. So if you want to know more about that, come talk to Chris or I at the end um, and we can put you in touch with them. Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, three relevant demos and I'm going to try and switch to the 
admin console as well at the same time. And these are uh, scenarios that I have seen across education. So it's to get you in the mindset of, hang on, this has happened. How do I go about this? So the first scenario is there's a video conference call and an unknown participant enters. Now, they shouldn't be able to do that today, but say you didn't have your settings correctly done. How do we handle this? Well, first of all, you need to identify the meet URL, the time, or the owner of the call. Um, use Jump into the investigation center and run a search on meet. You can download or export those logs showing the external participant entering. Uh, if it becomes a police matter, like if it becomes a serious one, there is a form you can fill out as well. Um, you can then turn that investigation into a dashboard and save the investigation or set an alert for the investigation. So let's see how we go. I'm going to open up my admin console. And I'm going to share this tab instead. Okay. So now I have the meet code. So this is an example where someone's reported it and you as the investigator have gone, okay, tell me what was the meeting code that you used. So I'm going to go into security and I'm going to go into security center at investigation tools. So welcome to the security center. I'm now going to go into my data source. Now, I know that this is a, a meet issue, so I'm going to go meet logs. I'm then going to add a condition, and I'm going to see the attribute. I'm going to say is meeting code, and the meeting code is this. Now, hopefully this works. Live demos are wonderful experiences. And you'll see it'll take a couple of seconds, and here we go. I can see a whole lot of things happening here. This gives me who entered the Google Meet and at what point as well. So it gives me all the uh, email addresses of the people that have entered the Meet. Now, if it's an anonymous user, which we obviously ask you to turn that setting off, um, there will be an issue where you will not be able to see their full email address, and that is for privacy reasons. However, if it's an internal person or a person that is known to the tenant um, or another workspace address or a Google address, it will actually come up and you'll be able to see if that person um, entered the meet or who was that person at that particular point. Now from here, I can obviously, I can um, export all of this information um, or I can do some extra actions where I can say, for example, the meeting, was, meeting code was still being abused because it was still open. I can actually force that meeting to end for everyone. Um, I can then go and do things such as if it's an organizer that of that meeting that set it up for whatever reason, I can actually um, suspend that user um, if they're using me incorrectly. So some really powerful functions there. Um, let's jump back to our next scenario. OK. So um, files shared externally with sensitive information. Um, so a teacher has decided to share files outside the domain. How do we identify these files? Well, first of all, we want to identify the teacher um, or the date, the time, or the content of the file. Run a search using the investigation center. Um, we would use our drive logs for this. And if we wanted to, we can change the ownership of it. Uh, we can then turn that investigation into a dashboard, so I'll show you that in a second, um, and then set an alert as well. Additionally, if we wanted to, we could start deciding on how we use um, Drive Trust Rules, which I mentioned before, or DLP as well. So let's jump back to the console very quickly. Uh, okay, two seconds. <coughs> Right, so here I am back in the security center. Jump back to the investigation tool. And here I'm going to type in drive and drive log events. Okay, 
I'm going to now who should we pick on for this scenario? Uh, let's see. I'm going to I'll probably just use you, Chris Fetcher, as an example. So this is where I'm going to say that the uh, owner is Fetcher. Now let's see what this comes back with. I thought you were going to look at my search history. <laughs> Kidding. We, we won't look at your search history. That's all right. That's okay. Oh, okay. So let, we'll see what comes back with these results. Um, obviously, Chris has a lot of files. That's why it's coming back. It should show us a whole heap of files that Chris has shared. Um, actually, we forgot one condition. So we've said, okay, this is Chris is the owner, but we also want to add the other condition of where the document has a visibility value of shared externally, right? So we think Chris is a bit sus, sharing a lot of documents, there's a bit of a leak coming that way. So let's see what comes back here. Partly true. Well, the investigation tool doesn't lie, so we will see <laughs> what comes back. And it can take a little bit, depending on what you're trying to pull back. Here we go. So I can see that Chris has shared some of these files externally. Now, participants looks a bit, bit dodge, right? So I'm going to click on this. Now, I can export all this list if I want to do it for an audit purpose. Or I can go in here and I can audit the file permissions. And hopefully he shared this with multiple people. There we go. So <laughs> he shared it with some random people and himself. Now I can say this looks pretty dodgy. Well, it does actually look pretty dodgy. <laughs> it does. Email address, please, at gmail.com. So I can click on this and I can set the access. I can change that access level to view only or I can remove access altogether. And I can do that on mass across um, a number of files as well. So it's a pretty powerful tool, especially for audit and um, investigation. Now, say Chris is a repeat offender. I can go in here and I can say create custom chart. And I can call this, for the purpose of this, I'll just call it Chris Monitoring. Um, just copy that. And I can save to dashboard, right? I can also save the investigation if I want to, so I can come back in and rerun it. However, once it's in the dashboard, there is no need for me to rerun it from the investigation tool. I can simply come in here. I can see that Chris has been sending out files on the 31st of October, and I can just click investigate. And it will also show me all the trends on, back on, on here. So it takes me back in here, automatically starts running the investigation for me. So think of it like that. If, if you have a, um, a security issue or you have something that's reoccurring, this is a really good tool, tool to keep track of it between the investigation tool and the dashboard. Okay, uh, very quickly, you can see I've run some of these samples before. You can see these are all my custom ones that I've set. But as you get down to here, you start to see the ones that are set up by Google. So authentication, encryption, spam, message delivery, all these ones, they're all pre-built for you. Um, and you can view those from a report, um, from the report center as well. Rich, can I just ask this question? Can you? I can see it goes from October twenty-seven to November two. Can you change the time scale on that? Oh, um, no, sorry, I see it at the top. I've answered my own question. Last yeah. seven days at the top. Yeah. Yeah. Um. You, yeah. You can change the date range. Um. If you'd like to. Um. It seems to be reasonably flexible. Um. Just remember the logs only go for about six months. Um. So the dashboards will reflect up to six months. Right. Okay, now I'm going to jump back. We've got about 15 minutes or so. I'm going to jump back to our third scenario very quickly, if I can find it. Okay, now our third scenario is... Okay, a student's account has been compromised. So a student has shared their username and password online. 
No one knows why they would do something like that. Students wouldn't do that. Um, and it's been used to access Department of Education stuff and communicate with others. What steps do you take? First of all, you identify who the student is and then use the investigation tool to run a search on the user login events. Um, if it comes back with Gmail messages, you can remove Gmail messages um, or remove the messages from the receipt's inbox. Uh, you can do all sorts of things. So let's start to go through that. Now, after the incident happens, this is where you may want to use something like context aware. Uh, context aware access um, that could help with that sort of thing. Set up alerts for suspicious logins as well. Um, and then do, you can also do a password reset on the user. So let's have a look at this. Uh, change back to my investigation center. Lots of loads. The old Australian NBN struggling at the moment. To see. Okay, uh, so user log. So we can either use user logs or users. So we want to have a look at the log events. Um, we can say this is a particular user. Again, I might just use I might just use Chris. Let's see what this comes back with. Now, the other thing this will pick up is things like suspicious login events. Um, so this is where, for example, um, our systems uh, pretty much predict where Chris is going to log in from. So if we know that Chris logs in from home and from work, that's a normal routine for him. If he logs in with a different IP address at a strange time, we're going to list that as a suspicious login event. He may have the right username and passwords. We'll still list it as suspicious. So you can see here, I can see when he's logged in, logged out, successful login, you'll see a whole lot of this, right? And what we're looking for here is you can actually see whether it's suspicious and we can add that as a result. So for example, I can add a, um, I can add a, a filter here, is suspicious. <coughs> and you can see here that there's only one event, however, and it was successful, I go across, if it actually works and doesn't freeze on me. There we go. Uh, there we go. So password challenge is suspicious true, second factor. And then also the IP address that's come across as well as part of that. And now my screen's frozen. So <laughs> with that, I may have to stop the demo for a second just because it's completely crashed. Okay, give me a second. I'm just going to bring up back to this screen. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'm now going to leave it open to Q&A and I'll try and get the console back up and running. Are there any particular questions or any particular topics that anyone wants to talk about regarding the features that I've just shown you um, and how to use them. Okay, so we're all pretty confident with these features. Security experts, hopefully. Every time I see you demonstrate the um investigation tool rich i just get uh, a little bit more amazed at how powerful it actually is yeah absolutely and the um the list that you can search on just keeps growing i've seen it grow um 10x in the last couple of months oh yeah okay so i just not, not my imagination i just thought i must have missed a lot of stuff in the beginning but it is actually getting more yeah. um, more granular i can uh if this can share again i can there we go something's working You'll see when I go into the investigation tool that there is the drop down has significantly grown. So uh, access transparency logs, which I mentioned before, 
uh, admin event logs, assignment logs, context-aware access. There's a whole heap that have come in here, even data studio log events as well. So definitely something that you should get familiar with and start using the tool before an incident happens. Try not to use it just, <laughs> just on a one-off basis. Uh, I think someone has a question hand. from Mick. Yes, Mick. Mick, feel free to unmute and ask a question. Do we want to take it off recording, Chris? Is that would people feel more comfortable if it wasn't if questions aren't recorded? Uh, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. So uh, what we might do is stop the recording uh, for anyone who's watching the replay. I uh, hope you got something out of that session. Um, so we'll stop that now. And for anyone who wants to stay in the call for a little longer and ask some specific questions, um, we can do that. So just stopping that now.